erection. But yes, out on drive and out all over the show today on uh, Wendy, we've got uh, Tess and Panda, of course, down there in the Eastern Cape at Amakala, Trishala and BK, and of course, our photo naturalist at Karicha Ralph. So that's everybody for this morning. So I'm hoping that we are going to find some great sightings and as you can see we are live and this is an interactive experience so please send us a questions or let us know what you would like to see today or even chat about as this is your safari and I'm happy that we can bring this live adventure through this amazing African wilderness as you can see we've got a beautiful male impala yeah, on Impala Plains, how ironic, as he's really enjoying this open clearing. But we had some hyenas calling just to north of us, and they did look up that side. I did also have a female leopard track coming up a Zoe's Road. Most probably it's quite a big female, so I'm sure it was for uh, Shadulu. So I am going to try and follow up on that uh, leopardess and see if we can find her around here today. But yes, it is quite a pleasant morning as with the weather-wise. I think uh, it's, it's, it's not too bad. I'm sure I'll be re removing my jacket very soon as uh, the, the sun starts coming up. It is definitely going to get quite hot around here today. So I'm looking forward to that. But yes, as you can see, these impalas are all very much relaxed here. Yeah? So clearly nothing has bothered them in this area and during the night or well, this morning. Yes, good morning to you, Bob. Good morning. All right, as you can see, it's moving away. Well, talking about the weather around there as well, let's see what the weather is like all over today. at uh, Juma today, the 35 degrees. Wow. I think this afternoon's animal bingo is going to be <laughs> it's gonna be a tough one out there. But uh, it's all right. You know, one thing we can do, we can actually just uh, do a little bit of dam hopping. I have been very successful at the dams. And there's some shade out there hopping. But I think more dam hopping will be the, uh, the answer to some great sightings today. But yes, I think on that note, uh, let's head over to where that hyena was calling. So I'm going to head over to another open clearing I'll up towards Impala, uh, Impala Road, towards the uh, power lines. It seems like that uh, hyena is calling around not too far from here. So let's go and investigate. Well, as you know, Shadulu, that female leopard, she can travel quite far, you know, covering the entire Juma very quickly. So. Sometimes you have to try, you know, think ahead of time, or like not ahead of time, but uh, think uh, ahead of uh, where she was, she wants to go, and what she's up to. And I think that's what I'm going to try and get to, is to get towards maybe towards Viotella access. Let's see if I'm lucky there. I know that uh, Tess is going to be working towards the eastern side of the camp. Um, that's because there has been some audio of uh, lions around that side maybe north towards Biffles uh, cut line so I'm sure she is going to try and search that area and hopefully she can pick up on something but yes what a way to start a beautiful weekend a uh, week on a Monday it's uh, with this amazing weather I'm definitely happy about that got my flask of coffee ready and uh, a little bit of hot chocolate with it I love uh, hot chocolate and uh, coffee together it's called a mocha choka, choka mocha, mocha choka. I don't know, one of them. Choka mocha, mocha choka, one of those ones. But anyway, I love having that early in the morning, especially a nice fresh day like this or fresh morning. So, oh, no. Let's take a look where this hyena is calling. Quickly investigate. Oh, 
Anna, so you got your cup of coffee as well. Fantastic. It's always uh, that's it. Cup of coffee, safari time, nothing better. Definitely. It's nice just to kind of just to float away on a safari experience and uh, having a cup of coffee without really worrying about too much. That's always it's always the best thing I say. That Ooh, that sun is coming through quite quickly as well. Tea for me, I can, I, I enjoy tea. I do enjoy tea, but <coughs> um, in small doses. I know a lot of people, my, my father, he loves, uh, he loves tea big time. So he will drink tea at every day at a certain time. But I think I drank too much tea when I was young, so maybe that's why I'm not the biggest of tea drinkers. But I should actually, it's quite healthy. I mean, I know tea is a very healthy drink, and especially on hot days. Apparently, a lot of people, it's like, I think it's an a old person's myth, or I can say like a, like a folklore kind of thing, where you drink tea on a hot day to keep yourself cool. So. Maybe you drink hot tea, to, maybe then you sweat, and then that sweat will keep you cool. I don't know. That's what they say. So, Raymond, good morning. Wow, you got the same name as my older brother, Raymond. Yes, uh, well, yeah, I'm sure you can. I mean, not to exact age, definitely not. I mean, if it's a young cub and all that, I, I've heard, I think it was Koa or somebody that was calling the one day at uh, the hyena den on Taxons. And you can hear yeah, it's a, definitely like a, a cub. A cub, not like, you know, it's not a real kind of uh, masculine call. So it's, uh, I'm sure you can tell the difference when it comes to cub to adult. But other than that, if it's in between to adult, I'm sure it'll sound very much uh, the same. So I'm not too sure we call there. <laughs> no idea. It could be a hyena that's uh, four years old. It could be a hyena that's ten years old. Um, no idea. No, uh, uh, I'm sure that somebody will talk to him. All right. Some impalas there. No. A lot, of, a lot of hyenas. Uh, oh, huh, all right. There is a tree there, a uh, bush, clearly. I think I'm going to go straight towards uh, Vuyatilla Access to see if uh, that leopard tracks for that female will make it went straight across because I know that it was quite nice tracks this morning, quite fresh. I'm hoping everybody that's been watching uh, the bingo games, the animal bingo games in the afternoon has been enjoying uh, that uh, show. It is quite a lot of fun. Definitely a lot of fun. And I think it's, uh, of course, once again tonight we'll have our third day of uh, bingo day. Uh, animal bingo day, so yes, definitely you must uh, stay tuned and watch us again this afternoon. Hopefully I can take a third win. <laughs> yes, indeed. No, I'm just joking. I feel like uh, somebody should, uh, somebody else should take it. But yes, uh, well, we're going to continue following up on uh, this hyena calls and maybe there's uh, leopard tracks around this area. Let's head over to Tess as she wants to say good morning to everybody. Good luck with the hyena calls, Cedric, but I will hopefully be preventing your hat-trick this afternoon. <laughs> but I am glad that we are all enjoying the animal bingo. I hope that you are as well, everybody. We are loving the competition. Good morning. I have started my morning on Biffles Hook Cut Line with a beautiful sunrise. It is quite high already. My name is Tess. I'm going to be your guide on safari here for the morning. Behind the camera today is Panda. 
Wearing gloves, can you believe it? We've hit a cold spell in the dip here. And what we're looking at is the whole of the east, uh, yeah, eastern side. I'm confusing myself this early in the morning. The whole of the eastern side of Bifosa Katlan, right the way up towards Cheetah Katlan, right at the end there. It's actually a little bit over that horizon that you can see and down and dip on the other side and much like Cedric started his morning listening for hyena calls and trying to figure out where they are I have started my morning listening to lion calls and trying to figure out where they are now we did hear them on dam cam but we could hear them from camp as well when myself and Cedric were getting the vehicles ready and so we decided maybe it's worthwhile just coming to have a look on Bifosa cut line towards Gauri cut line which is in this first dip in front of me here Unfortunately, low, no lion tracks on this side, so I think they might be just in Biffle's Hook. General sense of direction, I thought, around Gauri Cutlan, Biffle's Hook Cutlan Junction. But alas, no tracks there. So what we are wanting to do is check a little bit more of the cut line and then see from there. Maybe do a Gallagher shortcut or perhaps go forward towards Cheetah Cutlan right on the other side and just see how it goes. I'm busy deciding in real time as we speak. <laughs> so we've checked the stretch from Gauri Cut Line almost halfway to Gallagher Shortcut with no luck. So I'm tempted to go continue east the way we're facing and go straight towards Cheetah Cut Line, check this whole stretch towards Biffles Hook Dam. But at the same time, something is telling me maybe I should check Gallagher Shortcut in case there might be something there. Because oftentimes what happens is the lines are split up, they're a little bit further apart. And something is telling me I should check Gallagher shortcut. So I think maybe I should go with that instinct. <laughs> I think I'm going to give it a bash. Let's see. Maybe we'll get lucky and find Kara or Tavangumi. Maybe we'll get lucky and find the females in one spot and the male might be further east. We could only hear one lion calling. So that tells me that perhaps the S8 male might be a little bit further away. We can only hope. red-crested Kohan calling from somewhere in the fire break but I can't see it maybe we'll be lucky and find one today now I played quite strategically the last two days and I did pretty well I got very close in fact I was beating Cedric yesterday and I couldn't find a leopard but not for a lack of trying but I played strategically in the sense that I got two fairly difficult bingo cards out the way and the two that Cedric has won on I have got left to do today and tomorrow so hopefully that plays in my favor <laughs> I suppose we'll see <laughs> time will tell but we must do everything possible to prevent Cedric's hat trick unacceptable <laughs> Right, so we're taking it pretty slow on the cut line, just having a look for tracks, keeping a look out in the fire break because we know the lions like to relax in this area. And we are hoping that we're going to get lucky. So we are now approaching the area where last time we had lions calling at around the same distance. Myself and Gert were together and we found the S8 male along here when he had that fresh limp and we could see the Kruger male standing a little bit further away. Obviously at the time we didn't know it was the Kruger male until afterwards. And we could see them both and they were calling to each other and then walking along before the cut line. Oh, Wendy, you're squeaking. Maybe we'll get lucky. Oh, I think I see an elephant. Maybe we'll go there.
Right, I'm uh, just coming up on a sandy patch road now. I haven't seen anything really crossing from that side uh, north onto sandy patch or on Vuyatilla Axis. But yeah, I'm just going to just keep a, a close eye here. I'm going to go a little bit further up north. Maybe Tamangumi might be in the area as well. Um, I just want us to look around because this uh, this uh, burnt area on the right hand side, of course, uh, we had a huge fire. Yeah, in April, May, May times, and we had the fire this side, and uh, so what happened is uh, it was like a lightning strike, but it was just a small block, it wasn't a huge block that uh, the fire that uh, burnt and all that. So. What is nice about it, all this beautiful little green grasses and shoots that's coming out on the side is uh, attracting a lot of game. A zebra, wildebeest, uh, impala and coming into this, uh, uh, this section. And um, sometimes because of that, it will attract, of course, other predators through here as well. So it's always a nice area just to kind of drive through and just take a look if we are lucky here. Let me see this. This is that Verose eagle owl that hangs around here, that um, male and female that I've been seeing for the last few days. And uh, this fly is sitting up in this tree, keeping a close eye on that as well. Beautiful owls. I love the Verose eagle owl. Absolutely stunning. That owl with that uh, pink eyelids. It looks like it's got makeup on. Yeah, I think that's her Tlalamba. I know that uh, Tessie is working towards the eastern side, so I'm hoping that uh, she might uh, pick up on some female leopard tracks that side. Um, Tlalamba, once she went into Torchwood, it seems like she hasn't uh, come back in towards Juma. Unless she has, and we haven't uh, seen any, well, we missed her tracks completely, but uh, well, we'll definitely give it a bit of a go this morning. See if we can get some rosettes. Rosettes, rosettes, rosettes. All right, I'm coming to Baobab Dam. I'm just a bit worried about signal here, so I might just uh, go at snail pace. Because, uh, I don't want to go out of a signal area. How many elephants did we see yesterday at uh, Chitwa Dam? Oh my word! It was <laughs> it was uh, it was definitely like an elephant party around Chitwa Dam. Uh, well, we're going to continue towards uh, Bobab Dam. Let's head over to Pridelands to see what Chris is up to. How's that for a start for the morning? All right. We saw a lot of tracks there. There was actually we following leopard tracks and then we saw hyena and wild dog tracks. So there looks like there might have been a scuffle somewhere between all these. Shame. And there's only one puppy at the moment. And it is limping a little bit. So we could only assume what has happened to the other puppy all right we know what wild dogs are about they move they move so we will have to move while we try and keep up with them my name's chris Odie on cam ops we following wild dogs it wasn't our plan we were trying to find leopards and lions but i'll take dogs any day <laughs> They are on the road, so we're just going to check what they do. Shame. I don't want to push them too hard, but I need to maintain visual. There we go. There's a puppy. It, it can run. It's, it's definitely a bit of a limp. Here we go. Shame, boy. 
og gå og kan seg for sjøen. Det er en høy mortalitet rett blant Waldok puppies. Det er så sad som det er. Det er faktisk mye. De har mange enemy. Fast paced life. Ah, oh, they're still going. Right, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. Hold on, eh? Buckle up. There we go. Again, I'm not gonna. I'm, let, I'm gonna let them decide the pace. So whenever they stop, I'll stop. I'm gonna keep this sort of like 80 meter distance from them. We'll have an occasional vigil on them. Shame, little doggy. Doesn't look like anything is broken. It's probably just soft tissue damage but anyway like i said i'm gonna let them determine the pace when they stop i stop dogs 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 oh, yes now they're moving <laughs> interesting the adults every now and then stops just to give the puppy a little bit of a and that's dogs <laughs> they have one gear and that's forward and fifth gear all right let's stick with them let's stick with them let's stick with them Slowed down a touch now. Very nice, very nice. <laughs> Good morning. Helen and Helen's just amazed. Just, wow, what an intro! Yeah, no, we'll take dogs any day as an intro. <laughs> and I thought earlier I heard we, we were looking at those hyena and leopard tracks there. I thought I heard. The dogs are doing that hooting call, like whoop, 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 whoop. And I thought, no, maybe I'm just imagining it. But anyway, you know, they're heading into the burnt area, which means <coughs> might not be able to follow them through the burnt area. I also found going off road with dogs also slightly futile exercise since you go off-road okay they're going are we gonna go around let me quickly check my maps here right yep Gonna try and see if I can't manage to relocate the gang this way. So while we do that, let's go over to Cedric at Juma to see what he's up to.
Yes, Chris, you can do it. I know that you are going to get a hold of those wild dogs again. But look who we have here. Unfortunately, a little bit far here at uh, Boabab Dam, we have got one of the Talamati breakaway lionesses. And uh, she is just taking a little bit of a toilet break. It looked like she had quite a big tummy when we got here. She was lying flat. And I just saw this big bubble of a tummy. And I'll see what she's going to do now. So I'm hoping she looks like she wants to come south towards... Uh, uh, Bifflesuk cut line, but it's just her. I don't see any other lines, just the one female. And there is three of them, supposed to be three of them, with their five uh, cubs. Oh, she's got a big belly. And I'm a girl, you're so pretty. The light on her is just amazing. Don't go that way. Come our way, please. Yes, come this way. Ah, oh, she's just not listening to me. She just kind of gave me the cold shoulder. So she's heading a little bit further now into Biffleshook from, uh, of course, just on the eastern side of Bobab Dam. And uh, maybe she might be heading to the, to the other two females. Never know. Well, it looks like, what is she doing now? Another toilet break. No, she's just standing there. Yes, what a great start. A good old a tawny cat and uh, wild dogs there at Pridelands with Chris. Brilliant stuff. Definitely. We'll start like this and I'm hoping it's just gonna get better. Maybe she wants to lie down. I think she's gonna lie down. Sleep. There we go, looks like yep. Okay, so that's what she wants to do. Well at least we got still some uh, visual of her. As I say it is a little bit of a distance. But it's nice just to and you get these cats so early in the morning. I'm sure that uh, this female, will, sooner or later, she will get up and move again for some shade. But she's got a big belly, so I'm trying to figure out where... She, I mean, maybe the other two females might be on the kill somewhere with the cubs. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, I cannot go and investigate. I'll just have to go by other guides' uh, words and see what they say when they do go inside of her Biffle's hook. I did call it in, so... Let's see. But yeah, once it gets hot, I'm sure she'll go and look for some shade in one of those thickets or maybe under one of these quarry bushes around here. But for now, it's not too hot. So she's just lying in the open clearing. And she's listening in the north. Yes, but while we sit here and investigate what's happening around here with this uh, Telemati breakaway lioness, let's head over to Tess to see what she has got to show you. Well done, said. I'm happy to know that the lionesses are at Baobab Dam. Maybe the line I was hearing was S8 a little bit further east. We found a herd of elephants. I'm so excited. There's a massive, massive breeding herd. There's lots of little babies. And in fact, the one is over there. You're about to see it pop out. There it is. It's got so much attitude this morning. It's barely visible above the grass, but it is entertaining us like you cannot believe. Ears and trunk everywhere. It has no idea what it's doing with either of them or its tail. <laughs> Look at the tail. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'm gonna move us forward so we can see it again. <laughs> That's so cute. <laughs> so they all came in from Biffle's Hook and we're on the fire break now. And um, I saw the one elephant further down and I thought, okay, cool. Turned around and there was a, an elephant crossing behind me, but it looked like a lion because it was a young elephant. I just saw the top of its shoulders. So we quickly reversed backwards and this whole herd came out of nowhere. They just formed out of the out of the boundary, out of the thickets. Ah, oh, there's another little one there. So there's two tiny calves in this herd. Okay, let's stop here because we're gonna have a lovely big female in front of us. She's busy feeding. But I want to see if we can see those little calves. There's just so much going on. Ah, oh, there's one playing, but it might be behind a bush. Also, quite a bit of attitude for such a little thing. Look at it, it's going face down on the floor. 
So it doesn't know how to use its trunk yet, and what it's doing is trying to bite things off the ground using its mouth. And I mean, it's not hiding behind a big elephant, it's hiding behind a small elephant. So these two are tiny, they are newborn. Oh, look at that thing. Nose on the floor, tail up. <laughs> that is amazingly cute. Okay, it's moving off at speed. <laughs> Bye, little one. Panic! Mom, wait! Mom. While those move off, I do have a beautiful young male right in front of me now. He's come around. You can even see his tongue. Look at this. This is incredible. You can see his tongue as he's opening his mouth. It's not often you get to see into the mouth of an elephant. Wow. Oh, well, now we might not because he's taking half the tree with him. Ah, oh, he's dropped it on the floor, so maybe he'll pick up little bits and pieces from it. So close. Sorry, I'm actually... <laughs> my head is in, is in front of an elephant here. Ah, oh, he's stepping on it. So he's stepping on it to break little branches off. Oh, I hope we get to see into his mouth again. That was so, so cool. There you go, there's his tongue. Look how pink it is. It looks like this uh, Telemati uh, breakaway female is now just moving a little bit. I don't know what she wants to do. She's just gone behind that quarry bush. The only quarry bush that's practically on this open area. That's uh, she decided to go and hide behind. But yeah, there she is. Is she lying down or is she moving now? I just want to see if I can quickly reposition here. Like, um, quickly reposition and then see what we can get. 
Let's just see what she's done. Of course, we cannot go all the way that side because uh, we're not allowed into this area. Um, but I'll just hope that she's lying in the shade there now. All right, so she's just in the shade. I'm going to get my binox out here quickly. Do you want to double check on. Yeah, uh, she's just by herself, still, still lying around there. Um, this Telemati broke away. Like they've, they've, they've always hang around quite a bit around here at uh, Boabab Dam. I'm just thinking to myself, you know, soon we're going to have the Telemati breakaway, breakaway, breakaways, and the breakaway, 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 breakaways. And I mean, I'm thinking, you know, these three females, let's get another, another name for this pride, like the Boabab pride, because they're always around Boabab Dam. I mean, how often have we seen them here? And I mean, they had their cubs just to the east of uh, this dam as well. So, yeah, a thing to think about. Something to think about. Because, you know, soon you're going to get a lot of breakaways. And, uh, yeah, eventually we're all going to get so confused on which breakaway breakaways are around the area. And, of course, this uh, female line there, she is just by herself here. She's, oh, she's flat now. Usually the other two might be around in the vicinity. They might be on the kill somewhere, maybe uh, in the thickets. Uh, looks like maybe she came for a bit of a drink at the dam and is just taking now a nap. Big belly. And hopefully she will be resting around this area for the rest of the day. And she's got some shade now, a little bit of shade, but I'm sure that shade is going to disappear very very soon, as soon as this uh, sun comes further up, I'm sure she's going to move a little bit further into that thicker area. I always love this dam. It's such a nice big clearing around this dam area. And there's always uh, hippos around here as well. But it's very far to see, it's a bit difficult to I view them from where we are now. But as I said, I know that uh, she got her head up. She's hearing, she's hearing something, hearing something a little bit too, maybe to the west there. I'm not too sure what. I want to see maybe the other side around here somewhere. Just. I'm gonna give it a bit of a scan. Oh no, she's flat again. Nah. Well, I don't think we're gonna get uh, any more activity from this uh, female. I think she's definitely gonna be lying down for the rest of the morning. So I am gonna move away from this area uh, very shortly and I'm gonna see what else we can follow, follow up on. Hopefully we can get some rosettes. I'm hoping that Tess can get some rosettes there. Um, maybe I think she might have uh, tr tracks of a leopard. I'm not too sure. <coughs> Sorry, I'm losing my voice here. I think what I'll do as well from here, yeah, I must probably head a little bit east again along the Buffalo Curve boundary. Let's just see where those other lines are calling from, maybe get some trucks coming in. But uh, when we did here then this morning, it seemed a little bit further up, further up from Buffalo uh, cut line. All right, well, we are going to try and see what else we can find for everybody. Let's head over to Tess. She is also trying to find some animals for all you all. Earth viewers. Sounds like a good plan. I am on the Fossil Cut Line, so somewhere behind me, far that way is Cedric. <laughs> I'm going east towards Cheetah Cut Line. And we have left the elephants because they actually left us. 
<laughs> they left us on the fire break. They moved into the very dense thickets of a seep line. And I didn't want to follow through those thickets with so many little calves. They were on quite a mission. I can hear a red crested kohan. Where are you? Why can I hear you but I can't see you? They are so well camouflaged. Oh, I see it. Okay, on that termite mound there, Panda, do you see it? Right at the top, it's calling. Yay! Wow, that camouflage is unreal. <laughs> that is amazing. I actually couldn't see it when you went close there, Panda. So you can just see a little bit of the white on the collar. And you'll see its head moving if it calls. So I heard the clicking sound it makes when it snaps its beak open and closed. And then it starts calling. So it always kind of preempts the main call by snapping its beak and that just gets all the other kohan's attention. And then it starts calling. There you go, now you can see it nicely because it's actually moving more than just its head. <laughs> Very well camouflaged red crested kohan. And it might start calling again. I've just heard one calling in the far distance, and that might prompt this one to start. There you go. Christina, if you watch what it's doing there, I know it's it's quite far away, but the clicking sound is made by snapping its beak open and closed. So it's literally just sna slapping the top jaw or the top part of the beak down onto the bottom part of the beak. And it does it really hard, a lot of force behind it, and that's how it makes that clicking sound. So it's like me opening and shutting my jaw so that my teeth clash together. It does the same except using its beak. But it stopped. It doesn't want to be heard at the moment. That's okay, I'll give it another minute and just see. There you go, it's starting. You can hear that clicking gets a lot louder. There you go. So in the height of the territorial displays and breeding season, that's when, at the end of that very high-pitched whistle, that's when the rocket display comes in, when they fly high up into the air, fold the wings in and plummet back to the earth, as though they've had a <clears throat> some form of medical emergency mid-flight. And then as they're about to hit the ground, he'll kind of spread his wings and land safely. And it's a really cool display to watch. Interestingly enough, they tend to do it if you, it sounds funny, but if you rev the engine of a car, if you're driving past and you rev and they're mid-call, they might actually do it. But of course, we don't want to change its behavior just by revving to get it to do something. But it is something that actually happens. I don't know why something about the revs of the engine make them, make them bounce. But if you do have any questions for me, any topics you want me to cover about this red crested kohan, let me know, or about anything else. I'd love to hear from you. It's amazing having you with me and sharing this with you. So it almost looks like it's wanting another kohan to call from close by. So it keeps looking around after its call to see, well, to hear if there's anyone close by.
not sure what it's going to do. It looks like it's going to just relax. <clears throat> okay, it doesn't look like it's wanting to do any further display or calls. Oh, I might be mistaken. I'm going to give this one more shot. Let's see. It might start calling, it might not. It seems to be playing cat and mouse with us this morning. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I'm going down uh, Aubrey's road. I have left that uh, line nest. Uh, that Telemati breakaway female, and, uh, and I'm just heading now uh, with Vuyotilla access, and I think I might head out towards the Trias Dam, maybe the hyena den, and say hi to the Inas. So uh, I think it'll be a, a good thing. I haven't seen them for a while. So definitely, uh, while well, it's still nice and fresh, before it gets too hot. I think before it gets too hot, it's going to get very hot. So, you know, I'm like, I don't even know why I've still got my jacket on. I've had like a, little, like a huge opportunity now just to take my jacket off and all that, but I just decided not to, and I'm regretting it. But anyway, I shall remove it very shortly. Look, it's nice to stay with that uh, or that lioness, but you know, sometimes when they full belly like that and it's quite a distance and on top of it, yeah, maybe we're getting spoiled here in the Sabi Sands having lions right next to the vehicle, but on top of that, it's getting warm, it's full belly, I'm sure she's not going to do too much, so I rather want to go and see what else we can find around in this area. So if I have to go back there in the next two hours, three hours, I'm sure she will still be lying exactly at the same spot. So. They can sleep for quite some time during the daytime. They're really, pretty much specialists at conserving energy, but you saw with those Nkumas, they, they killed that kudu yesterday afternoon, must probably midday, which was very hot. So. And uh, just, just, just proves that the never not right nature on rock always changes up. I think going down towards the uh, Trias Dam, what I'm planning to do because of that female leopard that came up this morning on the uh, Zoe's, I might have turned, she might have turned into uh, another area and all that, and uh, she might have turned east, northeast towards quarantine, the uh, western side of quarantine. So I think I might just go on the western side of quarantine just to take a look if uh, I do come right with her tracks. Boom, boom. There's nothing crossing here. You know? I'm looking at on Vuitella access, and there's nothing. A lot of hyena tracks up and down, yeah? Plenty, plenty, plenty to see. The sun is nice and sharp this morning. Okay. I'm still holding thumbs that Chris can come right with his wild dogs again. <clears throat> it's 
Samantha, yeah. sorry, <laughs> spider webs. Uh, Shadulu on a Shadulu, Samantha definitely it is always uh, uh, a nice thing to see. Oh, any 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 leopard on a termite mound, I think it's always pretty. But yeah, definitely Shadulu on a Shadulu would make it perfect. Yeah. I always try to see sometimes with hyena tracks because there's a lot here and nice fresh tracks as well from this morning or during the night time and why, they always, why have they been using, utilizing this area? Uh, it's kind of a, puts a question mark to my tracking app, but yeah. Uh, Oh, I've got some impalas. Let's uh, enjoy these impalas that's situated here. There's a large fruit of the bush willow. And of course, here in the background there as well, a grey hornbill. And that is giving us an early morning chorus. Uh, Mandy, no, this like if it breaks, uh, if the antlers break, uh, breaks off very low and it uh, damages the nerve and it will not grow back at all. But even if it breaks the tip, the tip won't grow back, but of course still the bottom part will still kind of uh, grow from there. But other than that, if it breaks too low and it hurts the, that nerve, then it's pretty much tickets for that, uh, for that horn to grow further. Okay, here you can see the females. Just they're already taking uh, shelter. You can see, I mean, it's uh, half past six in the morning, and uh, that's Central African time. And you can see that these impalas are already taking uh, shelter in the shade. And they, I'm sure they are also preparing for quite a, a warm day that is approaching. And here's Cedric that's got a, a huge jacket on, and I see Gert, he's got his t-shirt on, so uh, definitely I want to try and, and remove this jacket as soon as possible. There's just the one female on this side, the rest are pretty much behind her. See, she's just busy ruminating. Compared to the males, you see the females, they do not have those horns. It's just the males that's got the horns. And there's a lot of females here, with the one male, of course. And they work with a harem situation. All right, well, we're going to continue up uh, down, well, down towards the southern side of quarantine and towards the hyena den. And let's head over to Tess, as I think she's got some horns to show you. We have found three very unrelaxed white rhinos. Now, these are not the same three that I have seen here before. I don't don't think I've ever seen these three before. They're hiding in the thickets. Look how well camouflaged they are from a distance. They look a bit like termite mounds. And we're just waiting for them to relax a little bit to see if they move. But for now, they're mostly just hiding behind the brush. And we can see ears moving and we can see tails flicking. Now, I think the reason they are so unrelaxed is because we can smell popcorn. I don't know yet whether it was a genet or whether it was possibly a leopard, but one of the two urinated or scent marked here. And I think that might be what's making them unrelaxed. Of course, they might also be a bit nervous of vehicles, which is why I'm keeping my voice down. They're definitely not as habituated as a lot of the other rhinos that I've seen and that's perfectly okay they're allowed to be as unrelaxed as they want to be 
I'm hoping we get a slightly better view soon. We can't move now because if every time we start the vehicle or move, they want to move further away. So we want to make them comfortable. We want to wait and see where they go. The younger one is coming forward, but still very well hidden. Now this is one of the misconceptions is that white rhinos are only found in savannah, in open savannah, in open grassland. This is not the case. They actually do like seep lines and thickets anywhere they've got a bit of cover because it does camouflage them a bit but it also makes them feel a little bit more protected I mean look at that you can barely see them in these thickets but regardless of the view it is really special to be able to show you white rhinos we are fighting so hard to conserve the species So it's special any time we get to show them to you. Now this also is a really nice insight into another side of rhinos that you might not be used to because we've been very lucky with open rhino sightings. We've been seeing them in maybe a few more of the clearing spots. I can hear a vehicle coming. It'll be interesting to see how they react. We're used to seeing them in slightly more open areas, so it is actually really cool to be able to show you, you know, an encounter where they're not as relaxed. To show you the little bit wilder side of rhinos. Let's see what happens, the car's approaching. Natalie, rhinos will have coming past. Interesting, they didn't react as much. Oh, there we go. There's the reaction moving away. So, they do have alarm calls. It's not a, an alarm call that necessarily we know or associate as an alarm call. Mostly they'll just run away if they feel that they are threatened. But rhinos have 15 plus different methods of communication. And so they tend to be able to communicate with things like lip smacking all the way through to vocalizations and body language and very, very heavy breathing. They use their sigh pattern or their breathing pattern as a form of communication as well. So I'm not sure which one to them is an alarm call, but they know what it is amongst themselves and that's what's important. Ah, there they go. All right, so the presence of another vehicle, you can see they're unrelaxed, they're moving off. And that's okay, we're not going to push them any further, we are going to leave them and we're going to carry on because we don't want to push them. I feel very honored that we had a sighting at all of white rhinos and that's just amazing. Thank you, little ones, big ones, little ones. Wow. So yes, they have so many different methods of communication and they know what the others are saying. I wish I could understand everything that they are saying, but unfortunately it's not the case. Okay, now we're a bit further away. I feel like I could talk a bit louder now. <laughs> okay, let's continue. What a morning so far. My goodness. Everything is happening today. Maybe it's the Lucky Wild Dog shirt. I'm wearing the Lucky Wild Dog shirt. And so we're checking carefully again. We don't want to miss any tracks. We don't want to miss any signs but I mean that being said earlier on when we had the elephants <laughs> they appeared out of nowhere they literally appeared out of nowhere listen up explorers we have a brand new prize. This time you can recline riverside at the breathtaking Settlers Drift Lodge at Garicha Game Reserve. Take a breather from your busy life. Why not treat yourself at the spa or wander into nature on a guided bushwalk, twice daily safari drives or even a boat river cruise. Open to all levels of explorers.
Sign up before the 28th of October and it could be you jetting off to this luxurious lodge. We were checking out tracks of what appears to be pixie pan female at Leopard Dam and while I'm checking it out these buffaloes arrived. But there's very fresh tracks here of her and looks like at least one cub and another young male. So we're going to try and see after this if we can't locate them. But in the meantime we've got buffaloes drinking. Very nice little scene. Seems like they're taking preference to Leopard Dam now since Ndlovu Dam is only really mud at the moment. You can see that the Egyptian goose is not happy about the presence of the buffalo. I love it when things unfold like this. You're busy tracking leopard and then suddenly something else arrives. The problem is I can't really walk around now here to see where that... Maybe I should... Uh... Look for impala tracks and the leopards will show up. <laughs> so the thing is now I can't walk around like I said because it, uh, not from a danger perspective, but it will chase the buffaloes away. So I'm going to have to wait for these buffalo to leave and then reassess these tracks where they've gone to. These are very fresh tracks of these leopards. thinking that they've gone over the dam wall perhaps towards some of those copies I 
It's a lovely scene. Let's just enjoy this. Goose is going ballistic there. <laughs> Hello there, Anna Marie. Um, Anna Marie's asking if Lagatha has been seen lately. Um, not on Prideland that I'm aware of. Uh, we have seen single lionesses but uncertain whether it's actually Lagatha so I don't have any confirmed reports of her but I'll try and find out if anybody has seen her elsewhere since she doesn't only stay on Brightland she does move around to certain places. Kayla, hi there, says, always find it so relaxing to watch buffalo, especially at the water, Kayla. I don't know, it's like the sounds and everything is so calming. Right after this, we'll go and see if we can't find any further tracks of these leopards. But it is very fresh tracks, I must say. I'm hoping that they're not far from here. <laughs> Goose. They're not going to leave, Goose. You can keep shouting. He's sitting in a tree there. Ah, there, Rolo wants to know, how do we tell that Buffalo has TB? Well, Rolo, I'm just going to quickly get onto my seat here. Rolo, Buffalo don't show much clinical signs of tuberculosis. Um, they are usually a maintenance host or vector for the disease. And they actually seldom go into the symptomatic stage of it so they can just carry it but sometimes if they become immunocompromised for some reason maybe they had a attack by lions or something and they start to you know the immunity system goes down not much signs usually the only sign that you'll see is sort of they have this emaciated sort of look to them they'll start to you know uh, often you'll you witness a bit of a cuff, but unlike lions, you don't see any lumps or anything on the body. But you'll see the condition; they become very, very thin, and a continuous cuff. But most of the time, they don't show actual symptoms. Or they don't actually develop the actual disease phase of it most of the time.
I'm having a lovely morning, eh? We started off with those dogs. Now some buffalo. Looks like they're slowly moving off. Well, we've had a lot of questions coming through with regards to the buffalo. I just want to encourage you to keep sending them. Let me know. I want to ask anything about the buffaloes or anything else for that matter. If you want to let me know if there's anything in particular you want to see. So send me those questions. Peaceful sighting with a buffalo. All right, I want to try and see if I can't find anything on these leopard tracks. Figure out where they are going. Let's, in the meantime, go over to Tessa to see what she has for us. I hope you find the leopard. We've got something super unusual. I'm so excited. There's a hippo out of the water. It looks like it's coming back from a long night of grazing. And it's thinking hard before it comes down to the surface of the water. It's just in the thickets on the edge of the dam. It does look a little bit wet. So perhaps it's been in and out of the water this morning. I wouldn't be surprised. It's a lovely day. It's not too hot, so... It's definitely something a little bit unusual to look at. There's another vehicle that's come up. Look how it's turned. It might run back towards the water now, increase its pace. So a hippo's safe space is in the water. You hardly ever see a hippo out of water in daylight walking around. You might see them occasionally kind of basking on the banks, but to actually see it out of the water and walking around is really, really, really special. So I am overly excited at our luck this morning. Oh, here it comes down to the water's edge. Ah, oh, look at those big flat feet, massive head. Let's see if it makes a splash. Are you gonna walk in calmly or are you gonna jump in in one go? I would jump in in one go so I don't have to feel the cold creeping up on me slowly. Oh, this is so cool. Oh, it almost looks like it's tiptoeing. Slowly acclimatizing one foot at a time. That is just super special. I love how calmly he's coming back into the water. And now we're more familiar with this view of a hippo. He's back out the water. But how cool to see the shape of his feet as he was walking, see him out the water. 
<laughs> Hello, boy. Welcome back. You can see he's busy churning up quite a lot of water there around him. So that's from him moving his feet, but possibly also opening and closing his mouth underwater. That was very, very cool. And there's a lot of birds here this morning, so I think it's going to be a great morning to spend at the waterhole. So Mr. Hippo is starting to settle. So what I will do is, since he's going under, let's have a look at some birds. Now, on the bank next to him on the left, there is a hammerkorp. There is a grey heron. And interestingly enough, they have all been chasing each other around. So we've got a pair of blacksmith lappings, a pair of hammerkorps, a pair of grey herons, and one saddle-billed stork. And the grey herons have been chasing each other around. The hammer corps have been kind of flying around together, but hunting at the same time. And then the saddlebilt stalk is kind of on its own mission. Here it comes now. Now this is the same female that was at Gauri Dam yesterday, I'm sure. Kind of moves between the two. And we've seen some super interesting behaviours this morning. Hopefully I get to show them to you. The one is that we've had a grey heron swimming around in the dam. It's been floating on the surface like a duck or a goose and paddling around looking for food. The other is that we've had the hammerkorps flying low over the dam using their wings to disturb the surface of the water and hunting on the wing. All the while the saddle-billed stalk is doing circles around the edge of the dam from one side to the other. Unreal. Oh, wading a bit deeper, the whole head went under there. Look how it's kind of spearing its beak into the water, so it's probing. It's kind of hoping that as it puts its beak in somewhere, it's about to catch something. So this is very energy expensive process. All of that fish or a frog here and there. Hammerkorp waddling in the background very cutely. <laughs> Such a good morning. Alright, here we are at the Juma Clan dance site. There is everybody's here. Uh, Ribbon is here, Cork is here, Koa, June, Ndebele, Swazi. Everybody's at the dance site at the moment, as you can see. Uh, there is a, another, it looks like some, uh, I don't know which male that's actually going in there, um, with uh, Masangita to the right. And I know uh, June is in that hole. Uh, June is there with her two cubs as well. As you can see, Swazi, Swazi making her way there now. I'm just taking a look. There's a lot of activity around uh, the Juma Clan den site here on Elephant Carcass Road. So, as I said, <laughs> not long ago, maybe about five minutes ago, there was a lot of interaction happening here with even Ribbon being involved. And uh, Swazi and Bele, Corky, of course, Corky being the matriarch. Anyway. As you can see, Corky lying there with Koa, and Koa, and Koa having a good old a drink from mom. And then, of course, we've got uh, Masangita and uh, Swazi. Pretty much a greeting. Uh, many times you'll find that our hyenas do their greeting by lifting their legs and actually just sniffing their genitals. So that's not Masangita. Looks like that could be Loki or Kira. That was just there with uh, Swazi now. Since that's the den site, there is another big one now. I'm trying to figure out who's the larger one that's with uh, Masangita here. 
and nudging pearls. June wants to just lie there and have her cubs suckling from her, but uh, these two are really pestering her around the den site or the entrance of the den. Oh yeah. If anybody can give me an idea of this one that just came down here now, I'm just trying to figure out which. Maybe it looks like a, maybe it might be a male that came into the mix here now. Another hyena coming down into the dip, coming through. Here comes another one. It looks like Intima. It looks like Intima has also just arrived here. Let's see, you can. <laughs> I've got Loki. <laughs> I'm sure Kira, they're going to quickly pick up on Mommy's here. Yeah, there goes Loki or Kira going straight towards Mommy to Intima. Hey, Mommy! Look, we're going to be very happy there now. Was these two females in Tima and Corky both had their cubs at the same time? It was around about March. Don't come to the vehicle. Yep, go lie down somewhere else. Thank you. Uh, definitely don't want them coming under Rusty before once again they stop pulling all these wires out. So not many of them have got full bellies. It seems like there's uh, one of a few of them haven't had much to eat. I would have thought they would have maybe made their way towards that uh, a uh, sighting from last night where those Nkuma females and their young cubs were busy feeding on uh, that uh, kudu, male kudu. Uh, I thought they might have ended up there and grabbed some of that to maybe drag back to the den site, but clearly that hasn't happened. I think those lions might have finished quite a bit of that kudu. Well, the female that you see at the moment, because it's a very uh, high, uh, like a matriarchal system with uh, the hyena clan, the female that's on frame now, uh, Corky, she is pretty much the matriarch of the Juma clan. And of course, her youngster Koa, that's busy suckling now, um, gets also a very high ranking uh, due to her mom being the matriarch. Okay, so it was Gangarika that came, uh, <coughs> I thought that was uh, one of the hyenas that I don't see that often. That was uh, here now, but we moved off. A little, a little missing Gita. This is a Swazi's uh, youngster that's now approaching Corky. Missing Gita's getting big. She's got a beautiful white coat, almost like a mom. Because uh, Swazi also has got that very light coat to her. And definitely Masangita is not far behind with that uh, coloration. And also her auntie, so Swazi's sister and Debele, exactly the same. They're very light females. That's why it's easy to distinguish uh, Debele. Oh, there's a bumblebee that's bothering me, bumbling around here. It's easy to distinguish this uh, Debele and Swazi from the rest because of her coat. <coughs> The same as uh, June. And June has got uh, the floppy ear and she's still pretty much got her hindquarters inside of that den. So I'm sure her two cubbies are busy suckling there from her. And she's very content with her life at this point of time. She's definitely happy where she is. A nice shade, perfect, perfect little entrance to a den. Almost like a little umbrella that's sitting on top of that hole. So. <laughs> It's nice for especially the the mothers that's got uh, very young cubs. 
always tend to lie at these entrances like this where Tal June is lying so that the cubs can at least suckle from her and plus she's got shade so I think it's a, a good choice in a den site for June. Teresa, yes, definitely. It was so nice seeing uh, all of them. As I said, unfortunately, um, yeah, it, uh, it happened very quickly that all of them were together at one at one time, and it was a lot of interaction. But it happened very quickly, so it was nice just to see the entire clan um, interacting with each other and actually just uh, respecting, you know, the uh, high-ranking females of the Juma clan. And uh, as I said, it was nice to see Ribbon come in as well for a brief, a brief stop. Okay, we've got another one coming here. Uh, we've got, yeah, yes, okay, Swazi's coming back. Well, Swazi's got a bit of a, a gash on her leg. Sorry, I'll uh, just uh, try and see if we can get her. Yeah, she is on a move. It's going to be a little bit tough. She's going to duck here. On her back, her right leg, a little bit of a gash, but nothing serious. Like a, she might have had a... Some little altercation or something. Oh, see, Corky, watch Corky, watch Corky coming in, making sure everything is a lot of. It's amazing how Corky quickly comes in there and shows his dominance. Hi, my name is Debbie Dean Hartog and I come from Pretoria in South Africa and I am absolutely thrilled to have won the Wild Earth Prize to the Woodbury Tented Camp in Amakala Game Reserve. Wild Earth has changed my life as I love watching the daily game drives. Thank you, Wild Earth. Sign up today and you could be getting out there to experience it for yourself. Wild Earth Explorers, it's in your name. Shoe fly, don't bother me. Okay, 
Uh, now we've got a very relaxed uh, Jim McLean there now, very, very kind of uh, chilled here. Not much more happening around here. So most probably after this I will definitely start making my way towards Twin Dams. I'm going to see what's happening around that side as it is heating up now. And I'm sure these hyenas are all going to find a little bit of shade. Some of them are going to lie in this drainage line. Sometimes I'll actually jump into maybe a treehouse dam, have a little bit of a swim. Or even a little bit of a mud bath. And I'm just going to relax for the day before it does start to heat up. And when you're coming up with the hyenas as well, with the taxonomy on the whole thing, you must understand that people think they're closer, they're related to dogs, and some people say they're related to cats. And, uh, they're part of the uh, carnivora day, uh, of course, and then of course your dogs is cana day, your cats is uh, fila day, felines, and then of course your hyenas is hyena day. So your hyenas is in this whole different category, where you'll have like your uh, art wolf, brown hyena, your spotted hyena, they will be part of the hyena day family. So they're not felines or they're not canines. All right, well, we are gonna move away from this uh, den site as it is very much now settled and uh, nothing much more will happen around here. Yeah? Let's head over to Tess to see how her safari is going. We have got a very bouncy and playful Steenbach on this side. I don't know what has gotten into it this morning, but it has been jumping and playing. I saw it from a distance and thought, I don't know what the Steenbach is interacting with. And you can see it's looking quite alert, so it keeps stopping and kind of moving its ears around. It's still chewing and feeding. Looks like a young male. Beautiful. But every now and then he seems to get a bit of a bee in his bonnet and jump in his step and he just bounces around. So I'm hoping that he does the same thing. Oh, going to the bathroom. Bathroom break. So Steenbuck are pretty cute when they go to the bathroom. Occasionally, oh yeah, there he's doing it. He's covering it up. Look at his front leg. Oh, he's doing it. So they kind of make a little bit of a hollow. They'll go to the bathroom and then cover it up with sand like a cat, like a domestic cat. Look at him. So he's trying to cover all of those little pellets that he's just produced. And this helps him cover up his scent. Because he lives on his own for majority of the time, he doesn't want leopards to smell, okay, there's some fresh steenbuck poo here. Let me find the steenbuck. So he'll try and cover it up instead. That was adorable. Oh. Look at him. He's ferociously feeding and bouncing. My goodness. What are you doing, boy? I've never seen a, a Steenbuck as playful as this one. That was just a glimpse into what we've been seeing. The way he kind of went down on his front feet there. Ella, you're 11 years old. Thank you so much for your question. Yes, in this part of the world, or in this part of South Africa, this seems to be the only antelope that hides its own poop, its own dung. I suppose because they're so small, they're vulnerable to so many different predators. So he needs to make sure that being on his own and being a bite-sized snack for a lion, leopard, wild dog, hyena, and snake, that he covers his tracks. So as far as I know, they are the only ones that do it here. You'll see impala middens, you'll see zebra middens, you'll see wildebeest middens, you'll see 
even dikers go to the bathroom but not cover it up. The only ones I've seen cover it up are Steenbuck. I might be wrong, but I don't think so. One of the little unusual things that these small antelopes do. Oh, I'm really hoping he bounces again. So I noticed him because he was feeding and then all of a sudden he bounced up almost like a springbuck pronking. He bounced backwards and started like hopping around from a distance. Look at him. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Just the cutest. Now I had a steenbuck on my animal bingo board yesterday so that's pretty cool. But speaking of, to celebrate World Animal Day on the 4th of October which is, if I'm not mistaken, tomorrow, very exciting, we will be continuing animal bingo. So what that is, is basically we'll all be searching for our favorite animals. We have to mark them off on a bingo board and this happens during our sunset safaris. Today is the third day already. Cedric won the first two, but the competition is still fierce. We cannot let him get the hat trick today. So this will be happening between Juma, Pridelands, Amakala and Madikwe. Each of us have a different bingo card every day. And then as we see animals, we mark them off during the sunset safaris. So we have to try and figure out who the bingo king or queen will be at the end of all of this. Like I said, we cannot let Cedric get the hat trick. So don't miss out. It's going to be a lot of fun. Bring your t-shirt along and come and join us for Animal Bingo this afternoon and tomorrow afternoon. I think, if I'm not mistaken, the two boards I have left, I might have Steenbuck on one of those still. So I'm going to have to try and find another one this afternoon. <laughs> Look how carefully he's checking. It's as though he spotted something that grosses him out. Like, wait, what are you? Looks like my brother when he sees a spider. <laughs> Look at him, he's moving away from it going, what? What? He's trying to size it up. Look at him. Kimberly, they are amazingly cute. They are the smallest little antelope we get here. And so, oh, there he goes. He is oh, so playful. I mean, just look at this. The energy, this, the, the compact cuteness. But at the same time, so much elegance, so much grace. It's just never-ending fun watching Steenbuck. He's doing a very good job of playing hide-and-seek from us now. I just want to give it 10 seconds to see if he's going to move out of there or not. If not, we'll move a bit closer because he's moving quite far now. Okay, he is settled. Let's see if we can get a bit closer. Chances are he might bounce around a little bit as we get there because he might want to move a bit away from us. So <laughs> Let's see, maybe we'll get lucky and he'll start playing again. Oh, there he's bouncing over the road possibly going to go back over the road again. Ah, no. Into Juma at least, that's good. <laughs> so we did find female leopard tracks by the way. At Hippo Pools Junction we found some female leopard tracks crossing out into Torchwood and my best assumption, oh Wendy, they're squeaking, my best assumption would be Tlalumba doing a little bit of a loop of that northeastern corner. Maybe that's why he's nervous bouncing around in case Tlalumba's watching. Saying, I'm fit, I'm strong, I'll outrun you, I'll out, out compete you here. So his main defense mechanism, if Tlalumba was to come along, is exactly that. He's got a very white rump, so he kind of flash coloration. He, he'll lift his bum to show the white, and it looks a little bit shocking to a predator. But it's also an easy target to follow, so he doesn't want to do that when he runs away necessarily. But he also uses this bouncing quick direction change just like he did earlier, after he checked out whatever it was that was making him uncomfortable. Ooh. I think if I was going to be an antelope, I would have been a, a steenbuck. As much as I love nyalas and I think they are so beautiful, I think a steenbuck is a lot more fun. And they're unusual. They're fiercely independent, but at the same time, 
really territorial. So they have a monogamous partner, but they don't see them every day and they territorial together, but also independent. And it's just, it's so much fun. So he is slowly moving into a much thicker section, so we might not get a great view if he continues moving towards the right. Ah, it's like he heard me. Hello, boy. You are just so entertaining this morning, so accommodating, without even knowing it. <laughs> Coming back towards the open area. Oh, look at him. He is in beautiful condition. Shiny coat, nice and smooth and silky. Muscle definition. He's not underweight. Energy like you can't believe this morning. <laughs> So you can see he picks his path quite carefully through the tall grass. Being as tall as the grass is a little bit of a challenge. You don't want to accidentally walk into a leopard because your line of sight, because your field of view is small. Because imagine an elephant can see lots and lots of things because it's so high up above the grass and the vegetation. For a steenbuck, you are part of the vegetation. That's the height level that you're at. You're in the thickest part of it, in the grass. So it's a little bit more difficult to spot things. But that's why he's got such big ears and an excellent nose. So he doesn't have to rely on his eyesight. He can use his other senses combined with his eyesight to keep him as safe as possible. And he's a good few years old already. He's got decent horns. He's not an old male. He's a young male in his prime. But he's a decent few years old already. Oh, look at that camouflage as he goes into the shade. Unreal. Thank you, boy. That was amazing. Stay safe. Hello and good morning, everybody. I'm so glad to finally be able to join you. And we have this beautiful elephant bull to watch as well. It's a little bit chilly here at Amakala. The sun also does rise a little bit later. I'm wearing my gloves today and a scarf and trying to cover my ears like this. But I'm just so glad that we can spend time with this elephant. It's me, Trishala. I have BK on camera with me and we've been really trying hard to position in a way that we could see what was happening. And now we have some action. So he's been moving around very slowly, very relaxed, nice big bull. He's pulled down this tree to cover his face now. <laughs> We've been following him for some time and he's, he's basically going around feeding. Not interested in anything else. He's gotten hold of a sweet thorn now that he's manhandling. He's sort of gentle, even in his pushes. The sweet thorn is a very, very, very common plant here, or tree here, Acacia curu, um, Virchilia curu. Him 
picking there. He wants the juicy underparts. He's been especially picking these sweet thorn treelings, very young ones. Oh, yay, I'm getting hot from Juma that I finally joined. Thanks, Tessa. It sounds like you've been having... Oh, there we go. It sounds like you've been having quite the morning safari with wild dogs and rhino. Amazing. I hope that we can add elephant to that now. I'm sure you would have seen some elephants in Juma as well, but you have an Amakala elephant bull here who is just really giving us a beautiful view of him feeding. He's not aggressive and he's just going about his business and I love that. Now of course he is hiding. So in these areas there's lots of oh, this area which is dominated by uh, Albany Thicket. There's a lot of geophytes, which essentially um, plants that grow from bulbs, or that kind of thing. So it's a, there's a lot of moisture storage in a bulb underground. And this area is characterized by that type of vegetation, along with other vegetation, but that's one of the characteristics of these geophytes. And because they're so full of water, and elephants love water, you often see them trying to dig it up. But at the moment, what we're seeing is him taking cambium. Bright red strips just underneath the outer bark of the tree. But he's also been pulling up, like I said, very young sweet thorns and chomping that. And also looking very proud of himself when he finally gets it out, gets it out the ground. It looks like he's trying to put it back in place. <laughs> Nicholas, hi, you say our elephant friend is trying to play hide and seek with us? I think so too. And I know that it feels like elephant could not possibly play hide and seek. They're so big, but certainly they can. Oh, that is, that is the most polite move I've seen from an elephant. Break down the tree and then prop it back up again. <laughs> Elephants are always doing something, and that's why they're my favorite sighting. Whether they're eating, playing, walking, drinking, whatever it is, they're always busy doing something. They're almost never just standing around or lying down. Well, if they are lying down, that's a sight on its own. It's always entertaining and always pulls me in, and I hope that you guys feel that way too. You watch elephants, you kind of get sucked in. There's so much... Oh! I believe that's called downward dog. Elephant version and with a snack. <laughs> he's been bending down quite a lot, so I guess he that's his preferred method of of extracting whatever he's wants he wants to pull out of the ground. really looks like he's trying to figure out which part exactly he wants. Elephants can be very, very particular about what they eat, what they drink, and they're able to do that because they can pick so easily with those two finger-like protrusions at the end of their trunks. If they didn't have those finger-like protrusions, they'd, pretty, they'd have to eat whatever they could get the end of their trunk onto. But because of those two 
almost like tongues in a way, but they're like fingers. Because of those, they can pick specific parts of the plant, specific things that they want to eat, and they become quite selective. Oh, that sand looks really nice and and loose, perfect for dusting on oneself. This elephant also got really irritated at some hardy does when we first saw him, which was quite funny. But he seemed so gentle otherwise. Other things were not bother him, bothering him, but the high-pitched shouting of the hardy does certainly did. Remember to send us your questions and comments, everybody. It's live and interactive. I am here right now in the Eastern Cape in Amakala with this elephant bull. 7.30 in the morning in South Africa. Right now, while you're sitting at home watching or maybe at work. I'm not sure. So send in your questions and your comments. We can learn together and we can just have fun and watch together. Also remember that tomorrow we're having a very exciting, very special AMA, Ask Me Anything. Have all the locations joining us and it's also World Animal Day and that will take, pass, take place just after Sunset Safari tomorrow, 4th of October. He's uh, feeling a bit dominant at the moment. Feeling maybe a little bit proud of himself. So there's no other bulls around or females. Maybe it's just the confidence boost from breaking down um, breaking down the tree and then putting it back up. You know, that's a sense of pride. Well, off he goes. Perfect timing, mister. You are such a pleasure to spend time with such a pleasure but now i'm going to send you over to some more gentle giants off with cedric and juma all right so we also got more elephants this side here in uh, the sabi sands as a juma and we are just uh, south of uh, twin dams and we've got a nice young male elephant there just enjoying some of this nice green grass that's here in this uh, dip. There's still a lot of moisture around some of these little pans. And this is the one that's just south of uh, Twin Dams from the pans. But uh, yes, as you can see, feeding nicely. Of course, the rest of the herd is a little bit further south of us uh, towards Baboon Pan. So I think this uh, one that we are viewing at the moment there, that is uh, young male, and there is uh, the rest of the herd. It looks like they are taking a little bit of a, a break under a jackalberry tree. You can see mom and calf. Not really a calf calf, maybe like a, we call it a bit toddler, because you can see how quite high towards mom's tummy and it's already reaching. So you'll find if it's a, about a one year old, it'll go right under mom's tummy. And you can see that youngster is already halfway up. So maybe about a four, maybe a five year old. And then there's another one to the left as well. And they're enjoying all the little jackalberries at the moment. Uh, a lot of the jackalberry trees are having little fruits that's falling down and little berries and that's why it's called, a, hence the name, jackalberry. And the elephants are really having a nice time with these uh, berries. I think uh, the other day Tristan saw uh, one of the elephants there uh, towards, I think it's Chilapan. There's a jackalberry around Chilapan area and that uh, elephant was also giving the jackalberry a bit of a shake. So all those little berries do fall down and to feed on. Just like the marula trees, they do the same and as well the torchwood or the greenthorn tree. But yeah, this young boy, I think maybe a good, well, I'd say about a 10 year old, 10 or 11 year old. Still pretty much with the herd. 
And you'll find these uh, young males once they get maybe towards 16, 17 years old. Because once the puberty pretty much comes into play and testosterone starts uh, climbing in the system, you'll get a little bit agitated and you'll start becoming a little bit more kind of a, not like heavy aggressive, but you know, you'll start um, irritating uh, the young calves in these herds. And then you'll find that the females will kick these males out of the herd, the matroc and the females will kick these young boys at 16, 17 years old out of the herd and then this young boy will eventually go on by himself and maybe join other males to learn how to go about his daily routine and where to go and, and how to control his uh, behavior. But yeah, eating and enjoying some of those nice lush grass. So, the elephants eat around about 85% of their day. The strangest elephant in fact that I know. Well, uh, Sandra, I think one of the strangest ones that I can actually uh, think of is that uh, I'm just going to try and run through a couple Yeah, Well, an interesting fact of how elephants keep cool. And a lot of people think that elephants are aggressive when they start waving those ears of theirs, flapping them back and forth. And an interesting thing about that, if that elephant, you can see on the ears, look at those big thick blood vessels that's running throughout the ears so it's uh, the skin is very thin on those ears so when they flap the ears like that now on hot days what happens it is cooling down that blood that is pretty much running through the ears and then once that blood starts circulating through the rest of the body that uh, blood will pretty much the cool blood will kind of cool the body down itself and that's how they can keep nice and cool during very, very hot days. That's why sometimes if it's extreme heat, they'll actually even throw water or mud on the ears and behind the ears just to cool it down. They say it takes around about maybe 30 seconds for 27 to 30 uh, seconds for the blood to circulate through the elephant's body. So 27 to 30 seconds. Actually, you can imagine that is so it's quite... Uh, uh, and that's quite intense. I mean, that's uh, such a big body and uh, so many areas for that blood to to reach. I mean, that's it's amazing. As well as in these beautiful breeding herds, you will have a female, uh, an old female that will pretty much run the breeding herd, kind of as. How can I say, uh, she'll be the matriarch of the herd and she will be the one that will choose where to go, how to go and uh, when to sleep. So, And they're very strict with it, they will listen to the matriarch and she's got a lot of uh, huge responsibility on her shoulders. But uh, unfortunately she is, so there is another female well, further south of us, but can't view there now, there's a vehicle that just came into our uh, uh, view. Point, but it's fine. We'll just stick with this one, and she will decide. So they, she's got a lot of huge responsibility on her shoulders. So that's, and I listen to it. It's, it's amazing how you actually can spend some time with elephants, and uh, especially when they're coming down to drink, even feeding. They are such interesting animals. You can sit really the whole day and just watch them. And another one as well in that trunk. It's called a fibroelastic uh, muscle. So fibroelastic muscle is like an elastic band, so it will uh, pretty much extend back and forth, retract. And there's around about 40,000 muscles in that trunk, and it's like rings. And it's divided into over 120,000 uh, segments. So a very complex uh, muscle system. And it's just really much extended in nose and... Uh, uh, top lip, upper lip. Okay, the other vehicle is going now. So it just uh, looks like they are heading off to to the east, and the people are still enjoying their safari. Fantastic. Always love sometimes watching some of these uh, lodge vehicles coming into sightings, and I love the expression of. Uh, overseas guests when they come here and uh, seeing just uh, these magnificent animals that we do have around in these reserves. 
and uh, especially the first timers, that's always used to get to me. So it was like that beautiful um, moments of, uh, you know, they forget about everything in life and just concentrating on what's here. So see the little ones sniffing up into the jackal berries, thinking, please, it's actually like I'm almost hoping that there was is a berry that's going to fall straight down its trunk there. <laughs> Do you know why giraffes have blue tongues? Or how many eyelids a crocodile has? Have you ever wondered how corrosive a vulture's stomach acid is? Or what the Milky Way has to do with dung beetles? There are so many fascinating wildlife facts for you to discover. What are you waiting for? Scan the QR code that appears in the corner of your screen, enter your questions, and our guides will answer you in real time on Wild Earth. So the very majestic looking torchwood tree is very well designed to keep out of the elephant's reach when it's an adult tree. So like this one, if I was to go and stand next to it, actually maybe that's a good idea. Let me do that to show you how tall it is because remember an elephant can reach up with its trunk. <clears throat> it can also reach up very tall even with its mouth. So to show you how big it is, let me go and stand next to it. And then you'll see the kind of height we're talking about on an adult torchwood or green thorn tree. Imagine being an elephant and trying to reach all the way. <laughs> so this is a really popular tree with elephants, but particularly when it's a lot younger. So that elephant we had this morning, that tree was probably still taller than me, but the foliage was at the bottom. So that canopy was really low down. <laughs> Eric, you want me to the tree? Okay, I'll hug the tree. It's a rather big tree. I actually can't get my arms all the way around, but there's a nice little hollow in here. I could almost fit into this hollow. Look. <laughs> it's a very beautiful tree. Covered in matabele ants as well. They're those big black ants. I can see them crawling all over the bark. 
very, very cool. Very cool. So this is what that elephant was eating this morning. You can't see the thorns so nicely anymore, but still worth looking at because it is nice to see a really big mature torchwood tree with all of those nice rounded leaves. If you look at the extreme branches, we might see some thorns. So maybe pandas like some of those hanging down, you can see some remnants of thorns. And that's almost that bottom line, those bare branches that you can see up at the top. That's probably the giraffe line. So that's where giraffes can stretch up to and use their tongue, extend the tongue upwards to pull leaves down. But it's a really gorgeous tree. A thick canopy so they provide perfect shade. And of course very, very useful if you're wanting to make a fire or anything like that using those seeds. But it is nice to come full circle and kind of go back to what the elephant was eating this morning. Main feature is probably those really rounded green leaves. They almost have a bit of a grayish tint to them. Balanites Megami. So it's got two eyes at the end, Megami. Megami. <laughs> Oh, I can hear a crested barber teasing me. I was looking for one yesterday. Couldn't find one. <laughs> Sharon, yes, at some stage, every tree that produces seeds must have seeds. So you get male and female trees. Usually it's the female that produces the seeds and every tree tends to reproduce like that. Some trees, you can break them off and kind of grow grow from from roots or stems but those would be the kind of more succulents big trees like this definitely would need to have seeds so whether it's pods from the old vacacias acacias vacacias the old acacias like now it's called senegalia and oh why can't i remember the other one oh it slipped my mind temporarily but yes all of them should have seeds or pods the pods might contain many seeds and that is how trees reproduce. So the, the actual fertilization or pollination process can be done by anything from giraffes, like with a knob thorn, it's majority giraffes, to insects and bird pollinators with nectar and things like that. <clears throat> and that's how the pollination process occurs. But then the seeds have to fall. And this tree in particular, when the seed pods fall, they tend to grow very close to the mother tree, very close to the tall adult trees. So they kind of fall at the bottom and then start growing. What is very cool that Panda and I noticed this morning, on the fire break on Bifusa cut line, in quite a few spots there must be oh, easily 50 or 100 baby um, African wattles growing together. And they're not even a ruler length tall yet. But after the fire, those pods have just shot up and they've started growing amazingly. So we'll have to show you next time we go past because African wattles are a bit faster growing than things like um, apple leaf trees or these torchwood trees, <clears throat> leadwood trees, also very slow growing trees. So it takes them decades, decades and decades to get to this size. It's a very special process because imagine what this looked like a hundred years ago without this tree here. Maybe this tree is 200 years old, maybe it's 100 years old, maybe it's 60 years old. It might be even older. I remember one tree at Angala being aged to over, <clears throat> I remember that being over 400 years old. It was an anna tree. It's just mind blowing to think how, how long it takes and how strong these trees are, how long they last. So this is a very lucky green thorn. It survived the elephants. But please, if you do have any questions, any comments, any stories you want to tell me, any topics you want me to cover, let me know. We are live, we are interactive. I absolutely love having you on the back of the vehicle with me. So I would love to hear from you at the same time. Oh, I've just noticed a beautiful virtual starling coming out into the sun and that iridescent sheen is amazing. Wow, look at that in this morning light. That is unreal. So I wonder if this is one of the birchal starlings that nests here. So the other day myself and Gert found green wood hooper and birchal starlings nest in this very distinct looking dead leadwood tree. 
And that's literally just behind Pundin. Uh, this is the same spot at the junction of Leadwood Road and Gowrie Main. I wonder if this is part of that nesting pair. Ah, oh. <laughs> it's giving you a hard time, Panda. <laughs> so that reflection. <laughs> You see, this is why it can be a challenge to find birds. I know we had a bit of a hard time with birds yesterday. <laughs> uh, this is why you think you've got it and then it just flits away. And every time you think you've got it, it flits away again. But this reflection of that iridescent sheen on the feathers is probably my favorite thing about a starling. I think my favorite starling overall is a violet-backed starling, which should be coming back soon. But it's certainly very beautiful to see these blue, green, purple hues from that iridescent sheen of the Virgil starling. <laughs> okay, we're going to try and get that starling back. But for now, we'll send you to Chris and Bridelands to see what he's up to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so I'll... Leopard search have not yielded results. I could not figure out where they've gone to from Leopard Dam. They must have crossed into the drainage or something like that. So I'm driving around now in the immediate area to try and see if we can't, from where we were, fan out a little bit more. And hopefully we'll be able to locate some more tracks but I've got a feeling they've gone into the drainage. The dogs have not yet come out yet from the block. I wonder if they're not perhaps made a kill in there. It's a very strong possibility. There's a lot of impala in that burnt area that's eating that short green grass there. So without further evidence, I can't say for sure. However, they had a good early bit of the drive and I'm happy to just drive around. Want to perhaps check towards Red Earth and that area if those dogs have not My name is Byron Lopesha and I am a naturalist on the Penguin Beach Show based down at Stony Point in Betty's Bay. What I really love about the African penguin is the conservation they afford other species because they are what is known as a charismatic megafauna. And charismatic megafauna have the ability to touch people's hearts and promote conservation of that area. My favorite questions from the viewers are the questions that I don't have the answers to. So the more challenging the question, the better for me, because I feel like it is great that I can go back and research. And what I love about Wild Earth and Penguin Beach is that I can share my passion for the natural world with viewers on a global scale and promote the conservation of this very special little species, the African penguin. <laughs> All right, uh, kind of Niala, <coughs> Niala South. Uh, I do apologize. It looks like a little bit of uh, technical difficulties there in our Pride Lens with Chris. I don't know, maybe Chris stood on a cable or something. Never know. But yes, I do apologize for that. But yes, I am going up in Niala South. Still looking around. I haven't even seen one. Oh, no, I'm lying. I'm lying. I'm lying. I did see one leopard track this morning on the Zoe's going north. So, uh, yes, indeed. Did get one, but other than that, uh, nothing else around this side. I know I heard something that uh, Tess had some uh, tracks as well. I'm not too sure where. I think it might have been Cheetah Cut Line. I'm not too sure, uh, but yeah. We'll just uh, keep our eyes open in this area. I'm going to head slowly towards uh, maybe north back onto uh, the boundary and the buffalo's are down here and just to see if uh, maybe those lines or that line nests uh, from uh, Bobab Dam that comes south but I doubt it, her belly was so full this morning that I think she's gonna she would sit just there
flies. Flies, flies, flies. So I'm actually just uh, like going through the for this afternoon's um, animal bingo. So I'm actually just kind of giving it a little bit of a th like a thought process here on what my strategy is going to be and uh, what, I, what areas I am going to work in. So it depends on the board I get this afternoon. So I also have to look at that. But uh, yes, I shall see what will play out for this afternoon's animal bingo. B I N G O B I N G O B I N G O his name was Bingo. Actually it's Bingo was his name. Bingo was his name. Thanks uh, Morgan yes <coughs> yeah that's the one and Bingo was his name. Well, I'm gonna just take a quick look at this uh, commune web spider here, a lovely little nest. Commune web spider. Lots of little spiders st staying together in that uh, little ball, and they're very small and they're non venomous, so they will not do any harm to us humans. But I am not a, fire, uh, a spider fan. But it's like, and they use all the debris, like leaf debris, and that in the middle, like a windbreaker, and then all in the center. So if there's like an insect, something that flies into that web, all of them will help each other to catch it and feed on it. We are having a pretty successful morning on all the different things. We've just been surprised by two kudu bulls in amongst some impalas. This is the younger of the two. He's got kind of one full curl of his horns. So I think he's about maybe three years old. If that's so, he's still a young bull, but the bigger bull is coming in now. That is the mature bull. He's just to the left. You might see the tip of his nose. He's very well covered in those thickets there. And I really want you to see his horns. There we go. He looks like he's coming out. Oh, look at that. So he's at least, I would say, five years old. His horns are pointing forwards again, two full curls or rotations, spirals. And they've chosen a very tough spot for us. They've chosen the thickets, which is very typical of kudus. You won't find them in the open very often. But it is amazing to see some big kudu bulls together. There was a cow as well, but I think she's further back in the thickets with the impalas somewhere. So we've got a bit of a tough challenge trying to find them. We can see the odd impala. It looks like mostly a bachelor herd. So you'll see some horns on them as well. There you can see them kind of scattered through the brush. Very tough view. But they are slowly starting to come out into the open. It looks like everybody is interested in the same thing this morning. It's breakfast time. Panda and I were just laughing saying it feels so odd but a lot of people in the world especially in South Africa are starting work now and here we are you know enjoying the impalas and we're almost at the end of a sunrise safari already everyone's having breakfast and we are we're almost ready to have breakfast as well but we're almost halfway through our day it feels like I don't know if that was Clary or Larry I think Clary Kudus get their name from the sound that they make when they run. They're a very heavy antelope. The two of them are very close together now, although not the clearest for you. Thank you, Panda. <clears throat> so when they run, because they're such a heavy antelope, they're the biggest antelope we get here. 
Ah, Larry, thank you so much, Morgan, for correcting me. Larry, I apologize for calling you Clary. Larry, there we go, I'll say it again for good measure. <clears throat> so the, the way kudus run, because they're quite heavy on their hooves, I mean, a big bull like this can weigh up to 400 kilograms, a very big bull. So when they run, then hooves make a very distinctive noise. Kudu, 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 because they gallop, they gallop away at speed. And so when they do that, then it makes quite a loud noise, and the theory is that's where the noise came from. There are a few other stories, or where the name came from, sorry, not the noise. There are a few other theories, but <laughs> yeah, I think that's probably the best, the best and safest one. Ah, here comes another kudu to join the party. Do we have three bulls there, Pando? Is the one in the middle the female? Three bulls, no way. So we've been surprised by another one. How exciting. I wonder if I move forward, if we might get a better view. I can see there's a mitre drain, but I don't know how thick the brush is. Let's try. You never know. It can only, can't really get much worse. It can only get, stay the same or get better. <laughs> Gotta try. It is wild out here. <laughs> okay, we might get lucky through this gap, Panda. There we go. So standing in the shade, beautiful boy. So the only antelope that's kind of taller than a kudu in South Africa is the eland or eland. And we don't get them here, they're more in rocky savannah, anywhere that there's rocky mountains, rocky surfaces, a bit more open grassland. They essentially look like a really big, almost a, a cow or a bull. But we don't have them here very often. I had one sighting of Eland altogether in my entire time at Angala, and it was two young bulls that were running through the eastern side of the property, a, a part called Buffalo Flats. It was one of my favorite areas, especially to do bushwalks. There's a lot of history there and some old artifacts and things. And um, they were running through Buffalo Flats at speed disappearing and I distinctly remember calling it in on the radio and everyone going did you just say you have Eland on Angala <laughs> and everyone wanted to come see them but they were so fast that we were the only ones that saw them it was quite something quite special but their tracks I mean their feet are huge if you look at a kudu's track it's you know a good eight centimeters long and Eland is closer to the size of a giraffe in terms of its hooves so much much bigger and very broad. Now it seems these bulls are being groomed by a whole lot of ox pickers. I can just see them kind of flitting across the bodies, especially focusing under the arms, down the belly, all those hard to reach places where there's creases. There you can see kind of on the leg coming up to the stomach, or the chest. Now unfortunately in the shade it's not the clearest view of whether they are red billed or yellow but through binoculars I might get luckier. Oh, hello big boy. Thank you for coming into a much clearer spot. We can see your bum very nicely. <laughs> Pity we can't see the horns as nicely but you can see them kind of sticking out that spiral corkscrew. So these are the ones that are related to eland, nyalas and bushbuck. It's all the spiral horned antelope in the genus Tragelaphus. It sounds very weird. Tragelaphus. That's how you spell it. Tragelaphus. Which literally means spiral horn. Wow. All the horns together. It's like they heard me talking about it. So you can see how those horns might be a bit of a hazard if you're trying to run away from something like a pride of lions at speed and your horns get tangled in the brush, you've got a bit of an issue. You're really gonna struggle to, to get away. So that's why kudu bulls have such strong necks. It's a combination of needing to fight, but also having to hold those very heavy horns ups. Horns, horns ups, <laughs> horns up. And oh, we've got a bit of a play fight starting. And then holding the head back to put the horns flat against the body when they run. 
Okay, we're going to watch him for a little bit longer and send you to Cedric to see what he's got. Yes, here in this uh, beautiful uh, jackalberry tree, uh, as we came up in the island north, we spotted this uh, blue-headed agama. Uh, there he is. So now what's happened, the head has uh, changed in the last <laughs> minute. It was very bright blue when we got here. And uh, now it's pretty much almost going towards uh, a brownish color. So exactly like kind of uh, for camouflage. So as soon as this agama feel, felt threatened by our presence, it kind of uh, changed the color duration of its head just to blend in with this uh, tree. But uh, yes, definitely it was a male because it was very blue. And why for the blue head is maybe there is a female uh, blue-headed gama that might be around in the tree as well. And he is just trying to attract her. But yeah, as well, on top of that, he's sitting pretty much on the eastern side of the jackalberry tree, enjoying this beautiful sunshine that's coming through. Also just warming up its body, so it at least can have more mobility for the morning and maybe chase after that female that he has been keeping his eye on. So yes, we will definitely see what he's going to be up to. But uh, yeah, I mean, Gert and myself are sitting in now, and it was... Uh, one moment we saw the blue head, as I said, bright blue, and then we just looked away, looking around, looked back again, and his head changed in a matter of seconds to this brown color. Clever, a good old uh, camouflage uh, technique to make sure if there's any birds of prey or any predators around you, that at least it will be not sticking out like a sore thumb with that blue head. At least he can look like the trunk of the tree. As you can see, you can hardly even see it like that. It's blends in so well. Yeah. Nice to see these uh, reptiles starting to get quite uh, active now uh, with our summertime coming through and as well I'm sure the snakes will start getting more active and all the lizards and monitors and skinks. So definitely exciting times for, uh, for the show. Well, when I'm trying to camouflage as well, sometimes you'll find that they'll actually use this. If it's not feeling threatened, sometimes maybe it's trying to uh, catch some insect that's around on the tree. It looks like his head wants to start turning blue again. It's from the above line, looks out here. It looks like everybody's now looking straight at us. Nice, it's quite a nice size as well. Kind of nice. Almost like a green on its head, eh? From a blue color, it's in a little bit of a greenish tinge on top of its head and towards the neck area. But now he's definitely giving us the eyeball. I'm definitely not too impressed with us, eh? <laughs> Looking straight at us. Is he? Oh, no, no, it's not. Looking away that side. Sorry, I thought he was looking at us.
My book is giving me a few issues here because it's blowing in the wind. Let me try and do that rather. Okay. Ah, now it's falling. <laughs> okay, wait, that's not working. There we go. Okay, so the aging chart of a male kudu based on its horns. So the two young ones that we had were about here. The one had smaller horns than the other. So you can see one full spiral pointing outwards ready to start the next one, about three years old. The other one, which was the first one we spotted, was about four years old because it's got a full spiral and it's already starting the second one here. So there's the four-year-old. The other one that we saw, which was the very big one, was closer to this. So two full spirals and already pointing. So it's not the easiest diagram to try and depict, but two full spirals and already starting to curl back into the third. That's about five to six years old, anywhere from seven years plus. They've got two full spirals and they're already into the third and kind of expanding it. But that's about as many curls as you get on a kudu's horns, a maximum of about three or two full spirals and kind of just into the third. So this is the spiral that I'm talking about, this more horizontal part. One, two, three, one, two, three, versus two on this one, one, two, and it's about to start forming the third. So there's the two. And then the slightly younger ones there, you've got one spiral going into the second and there's one spiral and the second is almost complete, but it hasn't started curving up yet. So that's how you would age a kudu based on its horns. I do wanna show you the Impala one as well. So I do need to quickly find that. I don't think Impala is too far away in this wonderful book of mine, if I'm not mistaken. There we go, there's Impala. I love this book, it is so good. Okay, there we go. This one's a little bit smaller, so it is gonna be a little bit more challenging. So this is, I was talking about it yesterday, what we call a penkop, which is very straightened horns at the top here. So that's at about eight months to a year. They've got very, very straight horns. Then you've got the rugby ball horns, which is at about two years old. So you can see, it looks like you can fit a whole rugby ball in there or a football ball, I suppose, American football. And then from three years, it started kind of expanding at the bottom, but the top has stayed straight. And then as you get closer to 10 years, it's the full backward spiral and then straight up. So the most of the males that we see are probably around four to six years old. So it's this period in between where it's no longer pointing inwards at the top. It started straightening out on the outside. So there's a much larger gap between the tip of the horns. And that's when it becomes a little bit trickier to age them. Then you've got to start using things like scars on the body because all of them will keep the shape from around four to five years old. They keep the shape of the open horn at the top as opposed to that rugby ball shape. Very, very cool, but a nice handy tool to have. And in fact, it sounds very strange, but this kind of tool was developed because of the hunting safaris industry, because people used to think um, or focus more on antelopes as trophy animals. So it's a very interesting story, but with the, with the creation of, for example, the Kruger National Park, it was created as a hunting zone originally. Obviously now there is no hunting, but at the time predators were seen as pests and antelopes were seen as trophies. And that's when aging an antelope became very important because you wanted the biggest antelope that you could find or the oldest of that species that you could find. And so predators were actually considered pests or vermin. And so they were not considered trophy animals. Obviously that changed over the years and now we focus on photographic safaris instead. It's very cool. It's a very, it's a very tight knit industry in terms of how that industry fits into the safari industry. But essentially, the safari industry would not be around this kind of safari because the original safari was, was a hunting safari. This kind of photographic safari would not be in existence if it were not for hunting safaris back in the day. That's how it all started when people started coming to Africa and seeing how much game there was. Fascinating story. It's a very long story and it's definitely something that we'll have to talk about another time. I see buffalo tracks. Hello, buffaloes. They look like they're crossing out into Little Ari, so maybe this is from yesterday or the day before. Definitely not on top of vehicle tracks. Hmm. Interesting. I 
I see lots of hyena tracks. So we're now at the Pan Systems on Shibamu track, or we're about to get there. So I want to do Shibamu track back towards Philemon's cut line. Just to make sure we haven't missed a Shidulu anyway. Or a tortoise pan or a Molwati. So this time of the day, a leopard most likely won't be moving around actively hunting. I mean, it is windy though, so there's always the exceptions. But very likely might be close to some form of thicket pan system, anywhere that there's nice tall trees, and just relaxing in the shade. Possibly up in the tree, but more likely somewhere on the ground. <laughs> Karin, yes, I can share which book that is from. I will stop to show you. So I've got a good few field guides. It's probably <laughs> the biggest thing that I have with me is a lot of books because I love having them with me. It's a book called Aardvark to Zebra. So it's basically the A to Z of questions and answers. And it's just a really nice book. It's got amazing diagrams and it's got really interesting fun facts. It's got some amazing questions and answers, things that we don't necessarily think about. Some of them are very arbitrary, like the lung capacity of a giraffe or, you know, things like that. How, how fast does its heart beat compared to all the other animals, things like that. So just some more unusual things. And I find it particularly fun because the photographs in it are absolutely beautiful. So if I do want to show you a decent photograph of something, then that to me is the best option. I don't know if you remember, that was a Stienbach racing at speed across the road. Here comes another one, it's stopping. I don't know if you remember, I had to try and find some lions <laughs> a while ago. I can't remember what the competition was, but we had to try and find some lions. And I opened that book and used my other book as well and showed you the sequence of lions hunting buffaloes because we wanted to try and find a lion gill. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, just uh, sitting here in a giraffe crossing on a central road. And as you can see in this big, beautiful knobthorn tree, we've got our nesting and our resident Wahlberg's eagles. As you can see, the one is sitting in the nest at the moment. And they arrived back here in this area around about three weeks ago. Is that about three weeks? About three weeks ago. Of course, coming all the way down from Russia. And uh, in our winter time, they'll head all the way back up to that area, and in summertime, come all the way back. And the same pair will come to exactly the same tree, the same nest. So what they'll do, like in the last two weeks, they've been just repairing uh, their nests with other sticks, make sure that uh, whatever damage has been done to those nests over the last several months, that that damage is now all repaired and now they can at least uh, settle uh, down and hopefully get little chicks coming through in the next couple of months. Sorry about the bounce. I did. I had a fly in my ear. <laughs> Just take a look. It's a nice uh, brown. Typical, the coloration of the Wahlberg's eagle is really much the brown color. Uh, but we are very fortunate enough around here that we've been having some nice pale morphs. Um, I think there's a pale morph there in the model white towards twin dams. And this one's partner is also a pale morphed uh, Wahlberg's eagle. In other words, meaning it's got a pale color, much lighter due to the lack of pigmentation. Mm. I hear some elephants over there at uh, Gurry Dam. It sounds like we've got a bit of activity that side. Shouting elephants.
But I think this uh, Wahlberg's eagle that's sitting up in the, in the knob thorn tree here in the nest. Um, in Afrikaans, they call it, a, is it a brain arend? I think a brain arend, yeah, brain arend. So that means a brown eagle, if I have to translate it into English. And uh, you can see the coloration. But as I was explaining with them, some of them, we do get those pale morphs. And uh, I'm trying to see if I can find the partner of uh, this one. Uh, it's quite a, a stunning specimen of an eagle. I love them. And it's amazing how they make their way all the way down from so far, uh, far north in towards uh, Russia's side and all the way down to the southern Africa area. It's, it's incredible how they get that direction coming through to the exact the same tree every single year. And with the partners, they are monogamous, so they are partners for life. So they will always stick together. But definitely he's got a perfect little area where they are nesting in this uh, knobthorn tree. Nice and high up, very safe. And uh, a nice viewpoint for them as well. So it is perfect. I've just got a, a grey headed bush shrike that is busy calling. That. Now in Afrikaans we call that a spook fool. So a spook means spook, like a ghost, and fool is a bird. So now if I have to translate it from Afrikaans to English, it means ghost bird. Interesting, huh? Afrikaans is very direct when it comes to the name. Brain ardent, brown eagle, and ghost bird. All right, let's have heard some elephants uh, crying towards uh, the Gurry Dam. So I think I might just head over to the Gurry Dam just quickly before the show ends, just to see what is happening there. It's just right here. Uh, let me find out. All right. Let's get that side, see if we can get these elephantes before the show is over. For this morning's. Sunrise Safari. And yes, indeed, I am looking forward to this afternoon's uh, bingo, uh, animal bingo game. As you know, we've, uh, this is uh, day three of our animal bingo. So please, you need to join us uh, this afternoon to see we will be crowned victorious over today's uh, game. I uh, have uh, taken the first two days and uh, put it in my pocket and went right home with it. I rode home with the, vict the victory. So yes, I'm hoping this afternoon I get a third victory. Let's see. Let's see. But I know, I know the rest. I know the rest of the teams. Uh, Lauren, Chris, Trishala, Tess. I know they are all amped. I can imagine they are rearing to get out there and uh, smash as many animals as possible off on that uh, bingo board. All right, so coming here, I don't see any elephants. Now I'm at Gary Dam now. Uh, thought I heard elephants crying there, but I've got uh, one giraffe. Let's see if we can get that giraffe quickly. Yeah. Gonna stop just yeah. Oh, got a giraffe that's drinking from the pan. All right, so the giraffe, nice male giraffe. It looks like maybe the same one from yesterday. A very beautiful dark one that we found in the Molawati. As you can see, nice dark uh, patterns on it, and a nice thick Aussie cones on top. Oh, typical for a male. Bit of a drink. Let's see if he's a spreader or a croucher. So many times. It looked like he was crouching there, but spreading, in other words, when they drink, they will spread their legs like sideways. A croucher means they'll kind of put their legs a little bit in front of them and bend their knees to go and drink. So sometimes you'll either get a spreader or a croucher. Hmm. Even here, a spotted eagle owl as well in the outlet in a 
background. But yes, I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to, to this afternoon. I am uh, definitely can't wait for this animal bingo once again, day three, and to see what we can find out there. So please make sure that you do join us this afternoon. It is going to be a lots of fun, and um, definitely we are going to push for whatever we can for another great day. But as well, from a Wild Earth team, we say thank you so much for all the comments, all the questions, and uh, just for joining us on our amazing sunrise drive. And hopefully everybody had a good time, and uh, we will definitely catch you once again this afternoon. So yes, from the Wild Earth team, have a pleasant day.